Hello everyone and welcome to Creating New Pathways for Skilled Employable Students, a Times Higher Education webinar in partnership with Coursera. My name is Alistair Lawrence, I'm the Special Projects Editor at THE and I'm pleased today to be joined by a panel of experts from academia and industry who are Anne Boddington, Professor Emeritus at Kingston University, Samara Farah, Skills Transformation Consultant at Coursera, DK Oniawa, Director of Partnerships for the Dhaka Region at Coursera, and Elna Shaw, Associate Principal for Education and Entrepreneurship at the University of Strathclyde. So I'd like to begin today's discussion by noting that personalised learning journeys are increasingly in demand and are also enabling an array of new possibilities for both students and institutions. However, the challenge of creating employable graduates persists and is arguably now more complex than ever before owing to increasing uncertainty in the job market that is in turn increasing calls for upskilling and reskilling those who are already in the workforce. So to start us off, I'd like to begin tackling this large question by asking the panel, how can educators identify what skills are needed to create more employable students? Um, Anne or Elna, I was wondering if I could come to you first. Oh, Anne, I think you're on mute, but if you'd like to go ahead, that's fine. Sorry about that. Happy to start, and I'm going to start by unpacking the two, defini two definitions. One is employability and the other is skills. And we claim we do both. And we judge a lot of that against the um, things like league tables and graduate jobs. And I think all those things, particularly post pandemic um, or what will be post pandemic, we hope, um, are under question. Um, employability for a start. Um, at the moment, we're still looking at graduate jobs um, and their definition quite in quite a narrow way, in, in a sense that cognitive skills probably in 10 years, we will share with AI and machines. So we might want to think again, and I would put three skills on the table, creativity, craft, and what I mean by that is how to do something as well as how to think something. Um, and something around care and um, the socialization of learning, which is what I think a university is fundamentally about. Um, and so there are things around that. I think the other, the other issue, which I would just challenge, I guess, is what employability means. When I hear, I hear um, governments talk about entrepreneurship and yet we can't count um students who start their own business and that particularly in the sectors that i work in is really problematic um because actually surely post pandemic what we might be looking at is um skills for developing uh one's own business to think again about the kinds of um skills artisans that we might be developing in what is supposed to be a new global britain um, and I have some scepticism, as you might hear in my voice about about some of that, if we don't think forward and think about what future skills might look like um, that go beyond the cognitive. And I think that's where universities have got and face quite considerable challenges. And I'll stop there. No, that's fine. I had a follow up question. Have you seen shifts occur already that are that are moving beyond simply universities being put on the back foot by lockdowns and, and the mass shift to online? are there green shoots emerging where people are start to measuring measure these things internally more effectively or perhaps collaborate more to um think about how the student journey needs to be managed differently over the next year or so i think we have to be careful what we mean by measure we okay. had a, a very interesting conversation about the difference between data and evidence um and i'd like to be quite careful quite careful about those two things um so i think i think that's one question I think there's a real struggle and, and it's a particular struggle with blended learning because the how, the practical skills that you need now, and I think increasingly we will need in a, in a world where we will, we will share with machines, um, will be really, really critical. The human to human dimension, how we are learn to be empathetic. You know, I see the same old stuff being, uh drawn out you know problem solving skills should we do a degree in problem solving because at the moment we don't know the difference between a project-based learning a problem-based learning and professional learning because they all start with pbl 
and that is a big problem for me. So I think there's a real issue about investing for academics in pedagogy, in sophisticated discussions, focused discussions about pedagogy. You can't get research money for it. You can't get, it's not valued in many places. And I think it is the, alongside all of the stuff about vaccination and um, care, the care discussion going on this very day, um, I think there is a real need to invest in sophisticated quality learning and what that means in a blended context. Okay, thank you. Um, Eleanor, I'd like to come to you next, please, just because, as I said before, you're Associate Principal for Education and Entrepreneurship at the University of Strathclyde, which implies these are two areas that are, are converging and in, in, in how, how, how you're addressing that with how you manage your student pathways. Okay, um, th thanks, Alistair. And, and certainly I agree with much um, of what Anne has, has said. Um, it, with respect to entrepreneurship, I, I take it further. I, I don't think we should restrict creativity, innovation and entrepreneurship to only starting up a business. That is one manifestation. Um, what we're, one of the things that we're doing at Strathclyde, um, we, we have a, a strategy called Strathclyde Inspire and as part of that we are rolling out a, a programme called Entrepreneurship for All. And, and what we want to do with that programme is ensure that by 2025 every single Strathclyde student and colleague has the opportunity to engage in some form of entrepreneurial learning experience. And that can take many different guises. It may be working with a small firm. It may be working with an entrepreneurial leader in a large firm. It may be undertaking some type of volunteering activity. But what it must be about is exploring creativity, innovation you know the things that i was speaking about craft i think that's important also and this idea of care socializing learning um, emotional intelligence empathy we, we're talking a lot just now about preparing for the the next normal i mean I, I think the one thing that we can count on is that we are never ever going to have the the stability up until um, today, even you know, so if, if today is, is 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 the first day, it's only going to get more chaotic. And um, we, we've been hit bad by COVID, but we know that there will be other global pandemics, and we know that there will be other externalities that are going to impact us. And so, what we really need to do is not just talk about things like resilience or being entrepreneurial, but actually giving our students the chance to develop the skills that are going to be needed to cope regardless of what that next normal is. So I, I, think, I think that's really, really important um, that we build these into our curriculum. So these are not things that should stay just within a business school. You know, linguists should have the opportunity, engineers should have the opportunity, all of our STEM students should have the opportunity also to engage, engage in that creative process so that they're able to, um, you know, develop innovative workable solutions when they're when they're they're met with challenges the, the other thing i do want to add just very quickly um, and i think we we've, we've previously spoken about this many of our students are working you know we we we, we shouldn't assume that they come to university they don't work so we need to prepare them for work I think we should be looking at the types of part-time and also full-time work they're engaged in while they're studying and look at how we can leverage those experiences to help prepare them for, you know, various futures because it's likely that they will experience various futures. Great, thank you, Eleanor. Um, to, to that point, I'd like to bring in DK and Samar from Coursera just to ask about the conversations that, that you're both having with the universities that you you work with currently and you know how are people mitigating these other externalities which is, as Eleanor noted can be quite chaotic and, and difficult to manage and also another point Eleanor made about embedding skills across interdisciplinary um, learning perhaps or just very different types of learning that, so it doesn't just get siloed into a business school or, or traditionally where you would teach a particular soft skill uh, alongside academic course curricula. Um, Samar would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. So it's, 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 uh, I, I wanted to step in to talk about this. And I very much agree that this is the direction we should be heading in. 
um, through the conversations we're having across Europe, I would say, and, and I would say globally as well, we are seeing some of the more forward thinking institutions really start to uh, recognize the value of uh, students having what we call a transdisciplinary kind of set of skills. You know, it's really not just about focusing on your discipline. It's not only about multidisciplinary uh, learning as well, but it's also about, you know, how you build um, a broad, versatile range of skills um, that complement what you're studying, but also ones that um, that you typically wouldn't develop when you're studying, right? So um, there are, you know, problem-solving, critical thinking skills that you're more likely to develop in some um, kind of perhaps um, uh, programs versus other creativity, which you would see a lot more of in kind of the, the arts and so on that you wouldn't get in other programs. And so we are seeing universities actually go as far as customizing these sort of um, kind of set of broad, uh, softer human skills, as we call them, um, depending on the kind of academic discipline a student is learning, just to make sure they come out with the with the most comprehensive set of kind of holistic skills that they would need. Um, on top of that, I would say um, one thing that we do very much see on Coursera and people coming to Coursera for is those digital skills that they will need regardless of what uh, industry they're going to be working in. There's no reason why students in the social sciences, which is what I studied, shouldn't, shouldn't have those set of skills that someone in the computer science programs will have and will have an advantage when it comes to finding jobs. You know, anyone that's studying any of the creative of, um, you know, programs, communications, for example, all of that is moving digital and students need to be, to, be, to be prepared for those eventualities and for the set of job roles that they may potentially have in the future. And that's where it is a serious responsibility of the universities to think about these things and to, um, you know, incorporate the, all of these new skills and, um, uh, and competencies that the students will need upon graduation, as well as those, you know, practical um, experiences that, um, that Anne and, and Eleanor both mentioned. And in terms of the, the, I mean, I know, as I mentioned, it, there's some skepticism around gathering data that is perhaps not as instructive or, you know, as evaluative as it could be. But is there now, over the coming weeks, months, years, more scope to really map student pathways or at least observe what students study when they have a, a free reign to pursue their own interests? And are you seeing any feedback loops being formed already where curricula are starting to be modified in response to that? I'd love to say yes. I'd say no. Um, um, I'm not necessarily seeing, and DK can, can speak to that as well, but I'm not necessarily seeing universities be responsive. Uh, you know, I, to be fair to them, it's been a very overwhelming year and a half, and so they've had a lot of other priorities to deal with, adjusting to the, you know, to, to uh, teaching online and getting students uh, adjusted to that. But I would say now that things are starting to um, somewhat stabilized, I think it's really crucial that uh, they use this opportunity because as students are studying online, it's an opportunity to um, use the data um, that they collect, and, and I know we want to be cautious about this, but use some of the information from, um, you know, those experiences and, and perhaps student surveys or surveys with faculty to really inform some of the things they're doing. Um, and the truth is that students really have a good understanding of what they need and where things are going. We know from our own research and, and from the, the data that we collect on our platform that 93% of students in universities um, are learning new skills on Coursera. 57% of those are learning skills that they're not learning in university. And uh, they're very much aware, both, you know, we know this from our own research as well as others uh, through the Student Academic Experience Survey in the UK, that they're learning, um, they recognize the importance of digital skills for their success in the future. So students really know, um, you know, and, and recognize the difficulty of what's happening and that they need a slightly adjusted, um, you know, academic experience. And so I, I, once again, I think this is where the universities should start to think about how do we, um, how do we adjust, how do we collect the kind of information that will help us, you know, provide these more personalized learning pathways so that we can better prepare students for what's to come. Thank you, Smart. I mean, I, I, I guess the obvious response to that is the, the sheer amount of man hours that are needed in order to really dive in and, and look at how you restructure curricula and, and, yeah. and, and, and the way that you do that effectively. Um, DK, what kind of conversations are you having with university leaders that you speak to? I mean, are they acknowledging these anxieties or is there sort of 
cultural change happening already in some cases? Um, it, it's an interesting question. Um, I would have to actually mirror my response to what Samar said, as I wish that we would actually see more of that. And I think um, there are some institutions who accept that um, the, the, the change that has been brought about the, by the pandemic has done a number of things. One, I think it's actually shone a light of the indiscrepancies between um, the different learning modes that universities may and may not have had in terms of educating um, from educators and also providing that content to or that relevant content to students. But at the same time, I think what we've also seen is that in certain regions where universities and higher education have closer links to industry, we are seeing we are actually, they are actually getting their insight to a degree from industry. So to, to use the UK as an example, I think it will become a lot more commonplace um, where businesses go beyond when they're looking to hire graduates they go beyond the, the 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 traditional request of you need to have a 2-2 or a first level degree to be considered for this role and moreover you will need to have for example an introductory or even in some cases an intermediate level of understanding for of this particular skill to be considered to this role as well i mean for example if we just look at you know business we see industry wanting you know learners to focus more on areas such as digital uh, sorry data analysis digital marketing blockchain and technology it's computational thinking experience design or c programming and you know the jobs that are in demand will, that will be in demand for the future um, look very different for the jobs that are currently that the institutions are currently teaching their students towards at the moment and i think this these are some of the macro social changes that are causing many universities to start to realize that it's not about necessarily doing different things, but it's about doing things differently from the point of how will they get their faculty, uh, how will they support their faculty to address that potential skills gap that graduates are facing right now between their and their end of time of higher education and then moving into a role. But um, I just, to that point you, about addressing job short, uh, short supply for particular jobs and skills, is there a danger that if, if universities get this wrong, they end up sort of chasing whatever's whatever of which there is a shortage at that moment and then if the supply um is filled or the technology changes you're perhaps in a situation where you've built yourself to to fill a, a meet demand that is no longer there and with that in mind it, does this bring back bring us back to our, the earlier discussion about saying that the, the skills then have to be paramount because universities need the agility to to change rather than necessarily think okay well we need to teach our students about blocked chain but then the technology or, or anything to do with AI or machine learning can advance at such a rate and so quickly that to, to respond to the demands of that could be exhausting without perhaps greater integration with industry or more work placements or, or, or other solutions that might be available. I think that ties back to the whole concept of lifelong learning, um, which I think a lot of more institutions are actually talking about now. Um, having individuals with multiple levels of understanding, multifaceted skills. Um, of course, one you can't be a master master of just one trade and a, or a jack of all trades and a master of none. But I think what what we will need to see from higher education is that a, a much faster rate of adaptability. So typically. If there was a curricula one year which entailed a certain amount of um, topics or content through a semester or through an entire year that may not necessarily be the case going forward where it'll actually have to evolve and change based upon what the you know the industry requirements are uh, so i think certainly having pre presenting students with the opportunity to have a much greater level of flexibility and choice which does not uh, act against their uh, university curriculum but complements it is very much the sort of the change that I think uh, we'll be seeing in the not too distant future. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I don't know. Okay. Oh, sorry, Smile. Sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry, Anne. If I may just add one point here, and I think this is where you raise a good point, Alistair, and, and I think um, this is where online learning can really be a great value added, right? So um, it's much easier with online content that is constantly being developed, uh, where you can really access sources, not necessarily just um, within an institution, uh, but really find resources externally through partnerships. I mean, I speak of Coursera because we work there, but there's many other, uh, you know, sources and platforms where you can access high quality content, both from universities and from industry partners, which I think is a is another great value added to provide that kind of, um, you know, work experience and and um, and and input. 
Uh, but I think when it comes to you know your question around uh, you know, preparing for specific jobs. I, I think we need to be cautious about that. But I think when we're talking about, when we see the kinds of skills that are needed, uh, we're talking about core digital skills, uh, you know, that would be relevant to anyone, regardless of which industry they're working in. Now then what adjustments you need to make to prepare for specific types of jobs, those are additional certificates students can get or, or specializations that they can develop. Um, but the core set of skills that we're talking about, those digital skills that actually we're not really seeing a lot of universities teach are the ones that are lacking. Basic data analysis skills, you know, basic programming skills. Those are the kinds of things that, you know, that we need to start seeing a little bit more of in addition to those uh, kind of human uh, skills, uh, how to engage and interact in kind of cross-functional teams, how to be empathetic, as Anne was saying, you know, all of these kinds of things will become a lot more important in a much more kind of remote uh, work environment uh, where, where you don't have the face-to-face -face interaction and you can't develop those skills necessarily uh, as you as you go into professional life. Okay. Thank you both. Um, and I'd like to come back to you just to ask, how, how do we stop this becoming too daunting a task when we sort of think, think about the, the, the cultural shift and the curricular changes that, that might need to be imp implemented in order to meet demand for, for, for employability going forward? I, I think one, one well, just checking I wasn't muted, um, one of the um, one of the things is to go back to some of the core language we use and i think we've got ourselves in a bit of a, a tangle we know we actually we kind of know what the issues are the universities have known what the issues are pre-covid covid's just shone a light on a lot of those things and it's really what a university what does a university promise and, and unfortunately, increasingly, and this is partly a league table issue too, is it, it promises more and more to give you a leg up in the job market. And actually, that's a really poor promise because we don't know what the jobs are for a start. And actually, we should be looking at, at giving students a hunger to learn and to carry on learning. And I think one of the things that this has really shone a light on for me is, is a sense that what, what we seem to do, and this is all over the world, we, we, teach young, we teach young people things that we've known for 20 years. We don't celebrate the ignorance of what research is supposed to teach us. So we don't celebrate, and I don't mean ignorance in a, in a mean way, uh, in a negative way, I mean ignorance in a positive way. What is it that we've got to discover in the world? What makes it people hungry to learn? And it isn't listening to somebody telling you what they knew 20 years ago. It isn't even people telling you what they knew five years ago. It's actually what what's the adventure of learning? And, and how do we socialize that? And how do we give you know new generations but also existing generations that need to relearn um the incentives to do so and i think that's what university is fundamentally about and we've lost a kind of sense of that purpose and that is a vice chancellor as a senior leadership role but on a on a micro scale i think you can dig into some of the that's why i came back to pedagogy in my first answer we've got to invest in the in the things that make those things happen and unfortunately i don't necessarily think it's about content anymore i think you can find content anywhere now content is everywhere so we've got to dig into as i say we let's talk about problem solving what is who owns the problem what is the problem how do you define a problem and do you seek a problem or solve it because all of those questions require different pedagogies. They require a different construction of what it is to learn. But we don't talk about it. We don't. I mean, the writing about it, the research about it is minimal. Really, it's just project after project. You know, and we're in a situation where we give students an experience. We don't teach students actually the craft. And that's why I used the word earlier, the craft of how to find a problem how to own a problem, what you need to then know in knowledge terms to solve those problems at a particular moment in the particular moment you're in. And that problem will shift. 
and it's all of it's it's for, for example students learning about uncertainty and and how you manage uncertainty in a problem how do you manage risk that really i mean i'd like to see a degree on risk i'd like to see somebody look really hard at what those things are you could run a degree on problem solving because graduates don't come out knowing how to solve every problem they know how to solve the problems that they've been given they don't even know how to own a problem in lots of cases so i think you know we are all grappling with problem solving you know the, the thing we're talking about today is a big university problem but universities with all the brains in them don't seem to be able to solve it so there's a kind of irony in all of this which is about digging into the questions that are really i think key questions of our time and really honoring both care but also uh, pedagogy in a way that we haven't honored it in the tertiary education system i think content is um, you know the last thing we need to worry about to be honest there's lots of people researching and doing that i'd like to just add one one more thing and then I'll, i really will be quiet um which is the other side of this which i think is critical and it comes to a lot of the points that were made is is around the relationship between staff academic staff and industry because it's not easy and this is an hr problem writ large for academics in this country particularly and it's slightly different in the us to move from industry to academia and back again so there is not the same opportunity for i mean researchers work with industry and all of that but actually it's very difficult to move in and out of academia into industry and back again and we've got to solve and make that transition much more fluid and that is a real hr challenge um, for higher education you've preempted the follow-up question i was going to ask which is <laughs> you know what what are the you know what are the things that would help educators the most now you, you mentioned before about there being a deficit of research into education and that presumably is something that would is a needs to be rectified over the medium to long term in terms of the immediate challenges that educators are facing at the moment when they look at okay how am i going to embed something like teaching problem solving effectively into my curricula how am i going to perhaps convince the surrounding department or the surrounding faculty that the time is right for a, a, a cultural shift or a curriculum shift in terms of how we do this other than a cult, the cultural change itself and being supported it, do you think there's anything in particular any additional support that those teachers need in order to be able to do their job a different way yeah they need time they need to have their career valued as you know brilliant teachers if you look at the career structure most career structures whatever universities say and whatever they've done still value research over teaching so to be a brilliant teacher puts you in one band to, put you, to be a brilliant researcher you can probably claim a market supplement and all sorts of other things and i'm sorry but the career structure is really divisive it affects it, it's it's gender driven it's class and race driven um, and it's often about who you know and not what you know which is also unfortunate in terms of some of those networks so there is a real issue at the bottom of this which is also a nature issue but it's a developmental issue which is to value the very thing that sits at the core of higher education which is learning um, and how we facilitate that learning in in all and every part of higher education rather than and I, you know I, I I'm a chair of the the uh, ref a ref sub panel at the moment but that doesn't mean that I only believe in research I believe in that balance and I don't want to see any system and I fear the ref may have done some of this unbalance or split contracts or give second class recognition to learning and teaching and the, the value of pedagogy which i think is never more important in a world that is going to need to learn relearn and relearn again um, over people's lifetimes okay thank you very much um ellen if i come to you next please i'd I just like to ask you a couple more questions about the importance of entrepreneurship and whether you think it has the potential or is it doing this already to to almost sort of force through a change in terms of the offering greater 
integration with industry and perhaps breaking down some of the barriers that exist to to stop the the back and forth for teachers from to move from academia to industry in, in the way that Anne was talking about okay yeah I, I mean i i think um entrepreneurship having an entrepreneurial mindset can can help us with many of the challenges that we're, we're facing just now and some of the challenges that we've been speaking about and um, one of the things i think that impacts on education not just higher education you know, and i think we, we need to remember that higher education is part of a much broader journey of education and learning and and what we don't give our young people or anyone actually uh, that much of an opportunity to do is to to fail and then to learn from failure and if you know, I mean, i was discussing this with my my own kids if they sit an exam and they say oh i don't think i got that question right and i say great that's a brilliant opportunity you can now learn from that rather than being worried about it you can actually learn and you know that's what entrepreneurs and that entrepreneurial mindset really gives people the confidence the mindset to not just lie down and just go back to bed whenever they they fail at something but actually to see that and i know this this sounds really jargonish but as an opportunity to learn but it's only jargon because we don't actually truly believe that in in the UK and, and possibly elsewhere across Europe as well. Um, so I think if right from the beginning, from nursery, the whole way through, we allowed our young people to explore what they are interested in, um, to support them when they, they get something wrong and allow them to identify how they can learn from that, that actually we would have a very different climate, environment and culture surrounding education including higher education so i i don't think there's a silver bullet to this but i think if we had much more joined up thinking across all of the different institutions involved in, in providing opportunities for learning that would help and i have to say this just comes to mind right now given the, the covid situation that we're in and um, school kids are uh, in in both in all parts of the UK actually have sat had two years where they have managed to get results through learning in their bedroom okay so my kids you know they're assessed they went back to school for two weeks they did some exams they got results based on those those what a dreadful learning experience for our young people so you know we've got our work cut out in universities because we've got coming to us kids who've had two almost two years worth of learning from their veterans and now we're expecting them to engage um, in in a learning that doesn't allow them any failure and, and really has metrics around how many students get first classes two ones and two twos rather than thinking you know developing different type of measures of of how how they are evolving as individuals as, as people and, and what skills they're acquiring so we do have a challenge it's not insurmountable and entrepreneurship can help um but but i think covid as Anne said at the beginning has it hasn't accelerated this it has shone a light and um, and i think dk the last time we spoke about this and you did make me laugh you know we've got a system that's how many hundreds of years old let's just stick with it you know let's not innovate that system let's just continue doing what we've always done I, of um, course, I'm, I'm being, <laughs> I'm very much, um, you know, I don't mean that at all. I'm being cynical. <laughs> I, um, I, I did want to come to back to DK and Samara about this, to, to ask about um, learning communities in particular, because it's one of the things that online learning platforms are um, often praised for in that they are, they, they create an opportunity for different kinds of learning communities to be formed and for new opportunities that are emerging around peer learning, um, and also, which is, you know, not a comprehensive explanation of project based learning, but project based learning seems to be adapting to that model in some cases by you know, the way that teaching and learning is being changed by some educators. What have you seen so far in terms of the emergence of learning communities using platforms such as Coursera? And have you had any feedback about it from your partner universities? I mean, do you, have you observed any significant changes or do you think there are any significant opportunities for universities to start thinking about learning communities differently by using online resources? 
uh, Swa? Yeah, sure. I, I can can go first. So um, when it comes to you know a platform like Coursera, there are a number of kind of resources that are available to a learner as part of the kind of self-paced learning um, to engage with peers. And now these are not just peers within their academic institution, these are also peers globally. And from that perspective, that is already a great exposure to um, new thoughts, new insights, um, ways of learning, ways of responding to things. So we always have discussion boards where students can interact with others. Uh, there's a lot of assignments that are peer-based um, uh, responses and you get feedback from your peers. So from that perspective, I think um, online learning really provides a lot of that great exposure and opportunity to interact with others. Uh, I think there, there is still a lot more work that we can do, especially within academic institutions to provide those communities for students to learn together. I think we all know, uh, and I think the research shows this, is that you learn best by teaching someone, right? So by if you're able to communicate and to, um, and to uh, kind of uh, explain uh, in an elaborate way um, a concept, then that's really when you've learned something well. And so I think there's a lot more that can be done in, in pushing this forward and really um, getting more of that social experience in an online environment than you typically would um, get when you're just studying on your own in a self-paced kind of way. So I think there's still a lot more that we could be doing, uh, but, but definitely some of the research that we have seen um, from our platform shows that when students interact with others, especially uh, early on uh, in their academic experience, they're much more likely to persist in a course um, or, or whatnot. Um, and then when it comes to projects, I think there's still, there's still a lot more that we can do there. Okay, thank you. Um, I would, um, yeah, go, go, go ahead, PK. Sure, I would, no, I was, oh, yeah, was going to add to that. So, I mean, I think um, you know, the start of the pandemic, at the, very much at the start of the pandemic, holistically, I think on a global scale, showed regardless of sector, of age, profession, um, has showed in event the importance um, of, of those learning communities, whether it was people just trying to get general information about what on earth was going on or from an academia point of view you saw people coming together sharing information um and these these forums these these groups these communities were formed in order to support each other and i think very much when we look at higher education as a whole you know le learning communities have shown and facilitated that collaboration can genuinely bring about positive change and i think when we look at learning communities sharing results and metrics to figure out what works what works best for whom and why um, we've seen a we've seen a highly sort of targeted and effective way for these groups to actually bring about impact uh, at scale and at speed. You know, when we when we've se we've seen great connectivity between people and educators, um, the ability to share and, and able to, to sorry the ability to share learning, and it's very much sped up the, the change and adaptability from key stakeholders, um, regardless of whether in high academia or uh, in the business. And I think certainly. You know, when we when we look forward, you know, as as Eleanor was saying, you know, I have uh, two young children as well. You know, my eldest was was sat in a, in his room going through classes online. Um, you know, and I think you know, when we look at that sort of learning community that was formed there, um, th I think he, when he's a little bit older, will actually expect that as he goes uh, as he progresses through his higher education uh, journey. So we have to. I think realize that the learning communities here are, are here to stay. Uh, will they become more advanced in what they can achieve? Time will tell, but certainly in terms of the notion of sharing information, the notion of supporting others, uh, recommendations, uh, metrics, assessments, all that sort of stuff, it, it will be here to stay. And I think it will be a force for good. And I think we see universities having certainly having realized that 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 constant ability to support students beyond the classroom is can only be a, a force for good going forward. Thank you. And I had another question about the the communities that Coursera fosters online because we have Coursera for campus, which is your university partners, but then there's also platforms for business and government. Um, I mean, I appreciate you can't answer on behalf of the entire Coursera organization, but do you think that over time with digital learning, there'll be greater convergence and, uh, and opportunities to support lifelong learning through things like greater alumni engagement and 
greater um, reaching back into higher education from graduates who want to continue their learning and also governments who see the opportunity to do this in a way that while it will always be a challenge to have standardized qualifications for micro credentials there will be greater integration and there will be perhaps more uh, more curiosity about what can be done by putting together different kinds of people to 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 learn in different ways yeah i think um so certainly i mean speaking on behalf of coursera as a whole i mean there are uh, three main elements coursera for business for coursera for government and coursera for campus Coursera for Campus was not created as a result of the pandemic. It was created in October 2019 uh, in order to actually address an issue which we believed um, you know, could, could help higher education in the long run. But obviously, as the pandemic struck, um, you know, our mandate became you know, significantly more uh, relevant and, and even more important at a much quicker rate. But certainly, you know, when we look at the support mechanisms that are there, it's not simply for students. You know, faculty i think people have underestimated the amount of pressure that they have gone through over these past 20 months and continue to do so and most likely will do so in the future but also when we come when it comes to issues in terms of graduate employability or youth unemployment you know there is a, a significantly large amount of alumni out there in the world who at the moment you know if they if they only graduated in the last few years or so they are in that demographic which is really struggling to potentially find a job and how does a university help them along the way and that's where areas like Coursera can certainly help if obviously they can't be on site then there are additional resources that of course you know can address that lifelong learning requirement that upskilling that new skilling requ requirement for for a new role going forward you know we've seen significant Im impacts on the likes of the retail and the hospitality industry you know and I think what certainly those industries have recognized is that there are additional skills and reskilling opportunities that they can support their alumni who have been able to who have not been able to find a job uh, as a result of what's happened in the last uh, 20 months okay. if i may just um yeah of course no, go ahead one more point to that so two things i i think um definitely we are seeing more universities that we speak to interested in engaging their alumni um especially now with the with a kind of readiness for students to for individuals to learn online and the drive towards lifelong learning so that's definitely um, some a trend that we are seeing uh, more institutions interested in and and that can only be a good thing right it's bringing uh, you know bringing together those two um, two two very important components of ensuring that students um, learn effectively industry and universities and, and kind of um, 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 kind of narrowing that gap. The, the second point is we are also starting to see greater partnerships between governments and higher education institutions or uh, industry and universities in some of the some of the partnerships that we're building globally. Um, we've definitely seen some of that in the US. We've seen some of that in North Africa very recently with with some partnerships that we've built. And so um, hopefully these are these will start to become trends. I can't say that that's something that we're seeing yet, but that would really illustrate that um, you know everyone's kind of working towards the same goal, and there's a little bit more kind of direction um, uh, you know uh, towards achieving some of these really important uh, milestones in terms of preparing young people for the future. So um, I, I definitely would like to see more industry um, engaging with some of the universities um, because they, they really see what is happening on the ground and they can inform um, you know, some, of the, some of the work that the universities are doing and, and vice versa. I think there's, there's both you know, a lot that they can learn from universities. So uh, we're starting to see some of these shifts and, and hopefully they will, they will grow. Thank you both. Um, Anne, yes. Could I, yeah, I just want to comment on that a little bit, and, and, and also it picks up one of the questions in the in the chat. I think we've also got to be quite careful that universities remain independent in thought. That's a it's a fundamental principle in a university that we are not at the service either, to be frank, of government or indeed um, of industry and, and that's a it, it's about the independent governance so it's it's how do you balance those two things out very carefully so it, you know i'm not i'm, I'm not going to teach on behalf of of a corporate or indeed a small a small business or indeed of, of boris johnson or whoever else becomes prime minister because actually that 
really destroys the, the very independence at the heart of good research, of research integrity and all of the things that go with it. And, and we can't take that away. But it's to, um, I think it's Avrinda has asked a question in, in the chat, which I think is a really important one, which is who pays? Um, who pays if we've got to develop academia um, or we've got to develop our academics? The point of research is that we do develop academics. And the point is a university, actually, particularly in this country, at least, and in all countries, the academic contract actually has um, research and scholarship built into it in, in one way or another. Even teaching only contracts have scholarship built into them. And actually, it's how that is invested and how that is um, developed is a choice. It's a vice chancellor's choice. And, and well and and the senior leadership team but but actually we have to we have to take that at a strategic level and say you know a university is a learning community in and of itself and we're, we're talking about learning communities and we we seem to only talk about students actually who is the learning community and who's doing the teaching and i think there is a real big question around that and that's why um we've we've all had we should think about actually students as teachers and actually academia as learners and we don't do that we separate out the students from faculty um, and, and actually don't think about the fact that actually we are all learners in that and I've learned more from students than I probably learned from my academic lecturers um, a long time ago but I'm still I'm probably a better student now than I've ever been um, and I'm, you know, semi-retired, haha. -ha. Um, and of course, now want to write and learn more than ever um, in whatever format that takes. I just happen to be a little better and a little more grown up about it than I used to be. So I think I think there are some real questions about that and about the kinds of investments institutions make. But don't don't tell me that institutions don't have the money. They do it's how they choose to invest and it's exactly the same conversation as the country at the moment is having about social care we need to know what kind of social care we want we need to know what kind of education we want in order that we know where we put our money not worry about well there's a separate issue about how it's paid for and who pays for it but we actually get those two questions quite often the wrong way around so the money is there but we have to want it and we have to choose to do that Thank you. Um, oh, Eleanor, please go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, Alistair. Um, yeah, I'd like to say a, a little bit about this. What I've observed in my own institution over the past 18 months has been a, a couple of things. One, a, 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 many of my colleagues have been on a journey and they've gone up a very steep learning curve because, the, you know, overnight they had to change how they work. They had to change from working on campus face to face to to learning how to use a technology. And, and you know, I think many of them have done that really, really brilliantly because without any training overnight, they had to pivot. You know, often when you're pivoting, you just, you get a little bit more chance and um, a little bit more time to pivot than, than most of the higher education sector was given. And as a result of that, so there's been a big learning curve to go up, but also I know that my colleagues have formed peer learning groups because it was the only way that they could take the advances that they, they were making. There was a lot of, you know, so that's one of the positives to come out of this. There was a lot of sharing. You know, sometimes academics can, can be very precious about their materials and they don't want to share them. I, I, I've not experienced any of that at all. I have experienced a great willingness, a great sense of wanting to come together to provide as best an experience as possible um, for our students. So I do think that those learning communities, and, and Anne's right to, to draw attention to this, when we talk about learning communities, we should not be talking just about student communities. We must talk about the educators as well, and those who are providing that learning experience. And, you, you know, at, Many sectors over the past 18 months have had such, you know, COVID has been such an external shock that they've had to respond to it really, really you know, overnight. And I think that the education sector is an example of, of doing that with some brilliance, with some brilliance that other areas less so, 
but you know there has been some brilliant developments happening as well um within particularly within universities i would say i i wanted to ask a, another question about learning communities which is despite the mass shift to online and many uh, and physical borders evaporating in terms of knowledge sharing and collaboration by teachers i mean i mean i've interviewed a lot of senior leaders in the past 18 months i've heard some really great stories about people saying well i've been able to do you know 12 guest lectures this year and i wouldn't have been able to do that before because i wouldn't physically had time to travel or my university wouldn't have let me because i have an, an obligation to them but i i was wondering if if you think that we will see local specializations emerge at specific institutions that might be in turn informed by where they are in the country or where they are in the world if only <laughs> i would say to that i mean i i i think that the fear and i and i completely understand it that universities have to be everything to everybody they have to answer a government agenda they have to answer um they have to answer uh, other local agendas. They have to answer industry agendas. I mean, I think it's a brave institution that says we do this and we don't do that, or that we collaborate. I mean, what apart from in research, where it's been driven through funding, really, that you can only get research grants if you collaborate with other people, and actually that's healthy and, and right, right the way across the world. It's not as common for institutions to collaborate with one another you know the competition competition issue the collaboration competition issue is massive you know have we all got enough students should we be taking more you know all the trading up that goes on and clearing here they all push in in directions that are probably if you take the interests of learning and the nation learning and the skills base don't necessarily work well for us. And I and I think, you know, that's where I, I, I think things, you know, platforms like Coursera are actually really powerful for bringing some of that together and some of the insights that they they draw on. But I think, it, I mean, it's a, it's a really tough job to try and balance those two things um, out in, in that context. But we've got to start trying because you know the, the whole process of things like micro qualifications and the fact that actually i should be able to do and take courses and degrees for as long as i am able to function and contribute to the, the world and and economics and all the other things that go with it but we're not we're still not a, a case where actually people contribute or education really, really stretches through life. I mean, lifelong learning aside, and I absolutely support it. We're still, you know, you look at the way universities function, it's mainly 18 year olds to 30 year olds, you know, to stretch that boundary a bit. You know, once you get to my age and, and, and older, you know, you're, you're an oddity in an institution. Part-time education has gone away and it's got to come back fast um and sensibly actually so that it's not an economic issue which is what stopped it in many in many cases so there are a whole series of issues in there which i think need some quite serious um challenges thank you Anne. um so Mark, i've come to you just to ask you and, and dk2 in the time we've got left just to tell us a little bit about the you know what you've observed in terms of collaboration and resource sharing across borders and, and regions and, and and how it's changing yeah, sure. If, if I may, I just wanted to comment a little bit on the previous point that was being discussed. I think one of the other things that we've been seeing or hearing from a lot of institutions is because of this, um, you know, this, this transition to online learning, there's also a lot greater pressure, perhaps that institutions place on themselves to internationalize to, um, you know, they, they associate internationalization with responding to rankings, with perhaps moving up in the rankings. And so they feel this pressure to attract students from different countries, to cater to their needs, uh, to attract faculty from different institutions. And so that really then um, uh, makes them rethink perhaps their offerings and so on, uh, which perhaps 
is not always the best case, right? Perhaps what you can serve is, is that local contextualized knowledge or serving that local market and, and students within those that, um, that would be working in, in the local environment and drawing on some of the expertise of people there. So I just wanted to, to make that point because I think that's definitely something that we're seeing a lot of institutions interested in. Um, when it comes to collaboration, I mean, I, I do agree with what was mentioned. And, and I think we all know that, you know, sadly we don't see enough collaboration that's happening across higher education institutions um, you know but we are you know we have seen um, recently in, in one of a, the partnerships that we've built a set of universities within you know a north african country that came together to um to, to kind of launch a program that would serve students across on a national level so we are seeing you know inklings of that but i would say um through our you know partnerships and relationships um, I, I don't necessarily see enough of that happening yet. Um, again, I would I would probably like to explain it by the fact that universities have been looking inwards because of everything that's happened over the last year and a half. They've had to focus on the students and on the faculty, um, and perhaps that's something that will start to emerge, uh, you know, uh, in the coming years as um, you know as opportunities start to grow. But I would say there's also they're also under significant financial pressures uh you know to perhaps lower the cost attract more students um, we see a lot of universities definitely in north america um you know shutting down because it's just becoming prohibitively expensive to start to offer programs and some students are pulling out of university altogether given the scenario that's happening and so i think perhaps some of these financial um uh, reasons or motivators might um, promote more collaboration um, because universities will just have to, you know, share resources and 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 uh, you know and think more strategically and innovatively around how they how they move forward and how they ensure their kind of longevity. Thank you, Samar. Um, we, we've got about five minutes left. I, I'm, I'm not going to ask DK to cover off all of the issues around access and international student journeys. We probably do another hour on that ourselves. But um, um, DK, I was wondering if you, if you had anything to add about um, to the points that Samar and Anne both made. Um, yeah, briefly, absolutely. I think uh, you know we we see um, different um, motivations, of course, uh, based on region um, in the developing or newly industrialized markets. It's very much about beef, beefing up content, um, providing additional access and content to um, students, and especially when it comes to more practical, applicable learning uh, through things such as our guided projects. That that really, um, I think, resonates with, with the students having more choice um, with limited uh, availabilities that may be placed on a local basis. In terms of um, Western Europe and some more and the in the more advanced uh, regions, um, I think it's. <clears throat> It's it's going to be a chain. It's going to be a case of changing mindsets. To be honest, as Eleanor said earlier, <clears throat> um, and I, I will I will elaborate on this. When uh, you know, if we look at um, different sectors, whether it be finance, uh, whether it be the retail industry, whether it be pharmaceuticals, whether it be um, business or whatever, those have all or telecoms, for example. Those these are all sectors which have changed quite significantly over the past few decades. Um, when we look at higher education, uh, it has pretty much remained largely unchanged for a few centuries. And, you know, I think when, when it comes to that, it's part of a mindset issue. Uh, it is a case of we have been doing things this way for a number of years. You know, do we really need to change now? Some institutions that we speak to really cannot wait to get back to the way things were. But I think, again, that'll be tempered by the demand of what students uh, will expect, given what they've had to experience. But ultimately, we see, I think it, this is obviously going to be a, a journey that takes a little bit longer uh, in the academia world or higher education world. But that change, I think, will be, um, well, will arrive sooner than people think. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we've got about two minutes left. I'm, I'm sorry we haven't been able to weave in all the questions that, that we've been asked. Um, and a number of you are asking about whether this recording will be available on demand and it will be via the Times Higher Education website and we will send a link to everybody who has registered today. So um, thank you very much for joining us. I mean there's been about 140 people in the room which is great and it's been really nice to hear from different people around the world and hear about the the different challenges that they're facing but also the commonality that transcends you know location and, and, and types of you know, borders and all the rest of it. Um, just to end I'd, I'd like to ask the panel if there is something that they are they're, they're most optimistic about for the, the future of sort of student pathways be that 
teachers as students, students as teachers, um, people entering a, a, an uncertain employability market, but one that has a, a lot of change going on in it at the moment. And whether they think there is sort of what fundamentally the, the, the biggest positive that they have taken from working with colleagues and what they think is going to happen over the next 12 months or so. Eleanor, would you like to? Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think one of the, the big positives, and this goes straight back um, to where Anne started us off at the beginning, we've really started to re-engage with how we help people learn because we've realised that in having to move at speed from lecture, face-to-face -face lectures and tutorials to doing every, you know, everything pretty much online, that's shone a light on what, what our profession is, what we do and, and how we can really enhance the learning experience. And, and I would really like us, to, I'd like to see that focus continuing um, rather than us as we gradually, you know, move into a next normal, um, going back to an ancient system that actually we, we think about uh, how we can harness technology, place, community to really help us um, provide great learning experiences across an, any individual's life, not just when they're at university. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Can I just add um, one point? Of course, Samar, please. So just, just to respond to that, um, one of our most popular courses uh, on the platform is called Learning How to Learn. So I think that just reflects exactly what you're saying. And that has only become particularly popular since the start of COVID, uh, both among faculty and students and actually learners more broadly. So just wanted to make that point. Right. Well, if we could add learning how to teach, that would be great. <laughs> it is popular among faculty as well. So that is that is changing, hopefully. Great. Thank you both very much. Um, I'm afraid that takes us up to time. So we'll, we'll have to wrap things up there. Um, thank you to Eleanor and Anne and DK and Spa for joining us today and sharing their insights. Thank you to everyone for joining us. And we look forward to welcoming you to future Times Higher Education events. Goodbye. <laughs>